Hey, this is Mohal Joshi from Los Angeles, California. I follow Indian foreign policy and defense with a special focus on Asia. You can follow me on Twitter at Mohal Joshi. Hey, this is Kishore Narayan from Bengaluru in India. I am an international relations expert specializing in global security, conflict resolution, and international negotiation. My focus areas include peace building and digital diplomacy. You can find me on Twitter at Veggie Diplomat. Hello and welcome to episode 30 of India Rising Strategic Affairs Conversations with Mohan and Kishore, a show in which we analyze the happenings from around the world and their impact on India. Before we begin with today's episode, we just hope that you and your loved ones are safe at home and are healthy during these troubled times. Remember to stay home and stay safe. 49 years ago, on December 16, 1971, Pakistan surrendered in Dhaka to the Indian and Muktibahini forces, marking the end of a short war resulting in the formation of the new state of Bangladesh. Unlike our other episodes where we look at current events, today's episode is dedicated to the war and how it has shaped the subcontinent ever since. Uh, hey, Kishor. So uh, let us start at the very beginning of the series of events which led us down this path uh, around 49 years ago. So uh, I'll start the story around like 1970, well, just mm-hmm. a year, uh, a little mo- more than a year before the actual uh, 1971 war between India and Pakistan. So in November 1970, like a massive cyclone called Cyclone Bola struck East Pakistan, which caused uh, a widespread damage. It was believed to have caused an estimated 5 lakh deaths or 500k deaths, which is like a massive number anyway you dice it. Now, the response to this cyclone from the government, which was under the control of West Pakistan, was poor. And this enraged the uh, citizens of East Pakistan to no end. Now, as, as, you know, as we know, like East Pakistan, which is like Bangladesh, was very different from West Pakistan in terms of language, uh, which is like, which is like uh, and culture. Like in East Pakistan, the dominant language was Bengali, while it was Urdu in West Pakistan. Now, there have been certain demands that the uh, Bengali be added as one of the official languages of Pakistan, which many of the West Pakistanis uh, sneered upon. I mean, there was a hint of uh, racism in there, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, a good example of this dichotomy was that the fact that the West Pakistan citizens saw themselves as an extension of the Middle East in a sort of an identity crisis where they don't want to be classified as part of the Indian subcontinent or have anything related to India, you know. I mean, something which uh, even lasts to this day that they would not classify them as part of the Indian subcontinent. While the East Pakistani Bengalis were comfortable as being as part of the overall Indian uh, subcontinent uh, population or heritage. Mm -hmm. Now, while a majority of the economic output came from East Pakistan, the real power in terms of governance, including bureaucracy, civil services, and armed forces, I mean, which is the armed forces officers, Mm -hmm. lie mostly with West Pakistan. I mean, one has to also remember that West Pakistan was uh, slightly smaller in terms of both land and even population compared to uh, East Pakistan. So uh, after this cyclone, what ended up happening is in a month uh, time in December 1970, elections were uh, held in both West and East Pakistan. Now the Awami League fighting under Sheikh Mujibur Rahman won uh, 167 out of 169 seats in the East which is basically just lost two out of 116, which is like a massive mandate and had full majority in the combined national assembly of 313 seats, which included seats in both the East and West Pakistan. Now, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the PPP or uh, party came in second with 81 seats there, which they won in the uh, West. So uh, what ended up happening is that uh, the army under the, military dictator Yaha Khan had stopped, had hoped actually that Bhutto would win either outright 
majority or could maybe possibly join forces with other parties to rule Pakistan going forward. Now, the resounding win by the Awami League had scuppered like these plans of Yaya Khan who now refused to seat the assembly because they didn't want like a uh, Bengali like Mujibur Rahman from coming to power. Now, uh, famously, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, like a few years earlier in 1966, had asked for greater autonomy for Bangladesh in a, under a six-point program, which was basically to get more uh, autonomy on a local level, while uh, like d- affairs like defense and foreign policy could be controlled by the com- combined government. But the, the the East Pakistan would have a larger uh, share of autonomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it, I think this arrangement uh, proposed by Mujibur Rahman was uh, pretty similar to the arrangement that we had witnessed in uh, Czechoslovakia, where the two entities, the Czech and uh, the Slovak uh, uh, units, would actually uh, self-govern uh, autonomously, but would have a loose arrangement in terms of uh, nationhood, uh, wherein the defense and foreign affairs and telecommunication, all that would uh, be governed by a federal government. So that that was the proposal uh, put forth by uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Mohal? Yeah, so now Yaya Khan and Bhutto basically could not let uh, Mujibur Rahman attain power as he could reduce the importance of West Pakistan in the scheme of things. Now the military which had a sort of a de facto control in Pakistan would now have their uh, control possibly loosened under a Mujib government. So while negotiations were on between the Awami League and the West Pakistanis, the Pakistani military secretly pushed more men into Bangladesh at the same time. I mean, interestingly, like some of these flights were reported to have been flown to Colombo and from Colombo to Dhaka because overflight over India was banned at that time. Now, on to, uh, things came to a head at, on 25th March when Operation Searchlight a military program was started where the Pakistani soldiers arrested, tortured and killed uh, scores of Bangladeshis who had opposed them. Now, the estimates on the number of people killed during what many call as genocide vary from like 300,000 to 3 million or like in Indian terms, we say like 3 lakh to 30 lakhs. Now, another sordid saga of this time was the mass rapes of women during this ordeal where it has been said that anywhere between 200 to 400,000 or uh, basically two to four lakh women suffered at the hands of the Pakistani soldiers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, Brutal, brutal uh, details that we read uh, on about these uh, atrocities. Uh, Yeah. Another thing that I just wanted to uh, uh, point out was, remember that uh, we have an international uh, uh, mother tongue day and that was actually uh, uh, announced in remembrance of the students from University of Dhaka who laid down their lives uh, fighting for representation of Urdu as uh, representation of uh, uh, Bangla as a national language in addition to Urdu in uh, in, uh, Pakistan. So that is the link that we have with uh, the International Mother Tongue Day. Okay, so uh, while all this was happening, a lot more was happening geopolitically also within the region and beyond. Uh, Archer Blood, the charged affairs in the U.S. consulate in Dhaka, sent a now famous telegram to the Nixon administration in Washington, D.C. regarding the mass atrocities being committed in East Pakistan. Remember, this was actually signed by 20 members of the diplomatic staff. I read, and this is quite an important uh, uh, telegram, I read, uh, uh, quote, Our government has failed to denounce the suppression of democracy. Our government has failed to denounce the atrocities. Our government has also failed to take forceful measures to protect its citizens, while at the same time bending over backwards to placate the West Pakistan-dominated government and to lessen any deservedly negative international public relations impact against them. Our government has evidenced what many will consider moral bankruptcy but we have chosen not to intervene even morally on the grounds that the Awami conflict, in which unfortunately the overworked term genocide is applicable, is purely an international matter of a sovereign state. Private Americans have expressed disgust. We as professional civil servants 
express our dissent with current policy and fervently hope that our true and lasting interests here can be defined and our policies redirected in order to salvage our nation's position as a moral leader of the free world." Unquote. So uh, when, when this uh, telegram reached uh, DC, uh, President Nixon and uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger proceeded to recall him from his post and eventually put him in a desk job. Uh, the reason for the indifferent attitude from Nixon Kissinger uh, to this genocide in Bangladesh was their secret outreach, outreach to China, which was so secret that it was even hidden from some in the State Department. After the, 19, after the 1962 war, Pakistan had grown very close to China due to both of them having a common adversary in India. Russia in the 1950s had a very strong relationship with its communist ally, China. However, due to several factors, such as ideological clashes of Chairman Mao with Russian Premier Khrushchev, withdrawing of aid by Russia to China, differing view of world geopolitics, etc., caused fractures among the communist brothers in arms. 1969 border clashes between the two nations near Manchuria cemented the Sino-Soviet split. Nixon and Kissinger saw this as an opportunity to establish relations with China. This was to further isolate the Cold War adversary Soviet Union by bringing China into the world fold. The US back then had no diplomatic relations with China. Kissinger was using Pakistan as an intermediary to pass on a message to China. Thus, he needed Yahya Khan and did not wish to put any pressure on him in any form whatsoever in spite of the mass atrocities in Bangladesh. Kissinger, during this crisis in July 1971, stopped by in New Delhi before he made his way to Pakistan. There, he feigned an illness due to eating some local cuisine and secretly boarded a Pakistani plane to Beijing to go meet Chinese Premier Zhao Enlai uh, yeah, and later in the summer, Kissinger wrote a note regarding the events in East Pakistan to which Nixon replied in a handwritten note, to all hands don't squeeze Yahya at this time. This made it clear to all the folks in the Nixon administration that he wanted everyone to back off from pressuring, press, pressurizing Yahya Khan. Now, uh, famously, Another thing, another tidbit that we keep hearing is that when Kissinger visited uh, uh, Chinese Premier Zhao Enlai in Beijing, apparently mm -hmm. he was given a book uh, written by uh, Australian historian uh, Neville Maxwell on uh, the Indo-China 1962 war, which gloriously painted uh, China in uh, glorious terms and accusing India of having started the 1962 war. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, uh, he, uh, helped to shape the narrative for Kissinger to look at India as the, as the wrong guy and also, th and also thought that uh, China was a friend uh, in, in, uh, in, need, in need for the next uh, foreseeable future to check the growth of uh, Soviet Union. So I, I think uh, Kishore, like book or no book, mm -hmm. I think uh, like Nixon Kissinger practically made up their mind oh, yeah. their bias against India. So I don't think a book would have changed their mind, but it's an interesting uh, anecdote. No, uh, in fact, uh, I agree with you that uh, possibly they already had their bias. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. they would not have gone yeah. uh, all the yeah. way uh, to Beijing feigning an illness. But uh, the point is that this would have actually cemented their bias. Uh, wherein uh, their biases would be... Yeah, confirmation uh, bias as we call it. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so while all this was happening, uh, to drum up more support for the Indian position, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi visited several countries, such as Belgium, Austria, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and even the United States of America, and also gave interviews to Western publications highlighting the plight of the refugees who were crossing the border and coming into India. She famously got a very chilly reception from Nixon and Kissinger 
around her November 1971 state visit to the United States. Both Kissinger and Nixon were supposed to have used crude and unflattering terms for both Indians and their Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. In fact, when the Indian ambassador to the United States had informed Henry Kissinger that India was considering sending back some refugees to fight as guerrillas, Kissinger had threatened that in such an eventuality, the United States would cut off economic aid to India. So India was now... And, uh, mm -hmm. and Kishore, I think this is also important to understand that in the... I mean, this was like the early 70s, but like uh, the late 60s, like India was uh, heavily dependent on uh, imported food grains. I mean, who can forget the PL480 food grain import that uh, India was reliant on United States. So there was a, uh, a sense of economic interdependence. I mean, interdependence, sorry, economic dependence of India on the United States. And uh, Kissinger tried to twist arms, uh, citing that aid here, which is not good. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So uh, with all this happening, India was now faced with a daunting challenge of uh, squaring up against China, Pakistan, and the United States, and knew that it needed to drum up support from anywhere it could. It was at this stage that India and the Soviet Union signed a treaty of peace, friendship, and cooperation. As per this treaty, both India and Soviet Union were forbidden to assist any third party that engaged in a conflict with the other party. In addition, Indira Gandhi managed to get an assurance from the Soviets that it would aid India in case of an armed conflict. Thus, firmly, the Soviets, the United States, and the Chinese managed to place themselves in rival camps in South Asia. In fact, amidst all these happenings, the United States had hoped to coax the Chinese to heat up the line of actual control across the Himalayas, as was witnessed during the 1965 war. Remember that in 1965, India had to station some troops in Sikkim to defend against Chinese calculated attacks, which in effect had blunted its defense against the Pakistani troops elsewhere. Mohal? Yeah, so... Uh... Now, so now moving on to the, there was a good rundown of the geopolitical situation prior to the conflict. So now coming up to the military buildup to the war. Now, <clears throat> uh, General and later Field Marshal Sam Manekshaw, who was the chief of army staff in 1971, in a now famous interview, which I think given today's internet penetration, everybody might have seen, uh, gave a famous interview, I think uh, 2002, if I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a few years before he passed away, in which he claimed that in April 1971, uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi invited him to a cabinet meeting. Now, in this cabinet meeting, as per what uh, uh, General, I mean, Field Marshal Sam Manekshaw claimed, that uh, the Prime Minister asked him point blank, like, what are you going to do about the East Pakistan problem? And I'm paraphrasing it here, guys. So, uh, like, Manekshaw was surprised at the question, like, he said, like, he asked the PM like back, like, you know, hey, what should he do in our opinion? So Prime Minister Gandhi, as per his recollection, suggested that he should invade East Pakistan. Now, <laughs> at this point, like uh, Maneksha replied saying that while he could not guarantee success, defeat was certain. He added later that he was not ready to start a war or a campaign right now and needed more time to prepare. Now, also with the approaching monsoon, it would be a quagmire to operate in a riverine territory in East Pakistan. I mean, also remember that Bangladesh is practically like the land of rivers everywhere. And then if you have to operate in the monsoon when the rivers are overflowing, when it's near impossible to cross the rivers, so you would be stuck. And also it would be like muddy territory or everywhere. And even like uh, tanks and arti uh, artillery and vehicles could get stuck uh, all along. Also, one of the other points that uh, Manekshaw made was that, General Manekshaw made was that with the monsoon approaching, it would open the Himalayan passes. Now, this could lead to a situation where the Chinese could open up a new front against India to ease the pressure on Pakistan. So what he did, uh, General Manekshaw, instead he suggested to the Prime Minister that she should let him plan for an operation in November when the Himalayan passes are closed, meaning the Chinese can't intervene and the monsoon would be over. 
which would improve the success uh, the chances of a successful campaign so uh, i mean the interesting part about this kishore is that even though this is like a, like a urban legend now i mean per se but like there is no official documentation that this meet ever took place or i mean how the exchange went through so but it is like ingrained ingrained in the folklore i guess uh, of the 71 war yeah yeah i mean that only that only uh, uh, highlights the valor and uh, and genius that uh, sam manacha was yeah 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 i mean definitely there was a pushback from the eastern army command and the army command oh, right right but yes. uh, we just don't know whether it went in exactly this sequence of events or was it less dramatic uh, than what was uh, what has been stated on record by uh, the field marshal right. anyways so mili- moving on see like uh, now coming to the military posture so see in india in 1971 had just in the last decade decade before that like fought two wars with uh, like one with china in 62 and the 65 war with pakistan now the 65 war with pakistan there wasn't uh, much action uh, or negligible action in this, on the eastern front so what happened is that the military posture was that the bulk of its of our forces were concentrated towards the west against west pakistan and in the north versus uh, tibet or china so this meant that in the run up to the eventual war forces would have to be moved to the border area with east pakistan where they were very thinly deployed in comparison so what the indian military planners had planned for is like to have three separate army corps formations for the campaign in the eastern sector so there would be the two corps in uh, west bengal under lieutenant general uh, t n raina the 33 corps uh based in sikkim under uh, lieutenant general ml thapan and the four core in the tripura under lieutenant general sagat singh uh another ad hoc force i mean uh, called the 101 communication zone was uh, based in meghalaya it was kind of a, a force to uh, aid uh, i mean make an ingress into northern uh, bangladesh but also it was kind of a buffer force in case the chinese intervene they need to swing the troops the other way towards the north it could be used in that reason now a sort of calculated risk was done by the linden military planners that a portion of the 33 core which was facing uh, which was based in uh, sikkim facing china and the four core which was uh, fa- facing like the uh, in the northeast uh, the chinese threat they were like uh, repositioned to a certain extent to face the Uh, the bangladesh border versus the tibet border uh, however the call to move the reserve forces facing the chinese was not consented to just in case the chinese made any moves across the lac to help relieve the pressure on the pakistan once the proverbial balloon went up so uh, this was the military posture now on the pakistani side the they were in sort of a dilemma on how to defend like eastern pakistan they knew the war was coming so the pakistan had a formidable force on its hand they did have like over 100000 troops to defend uh, but like the question for the military planners was should they fall back to the capital dhaka and defend the triangle area between the three big rivers the meghna the padma and the jamuna which would be a formidable defense because you could concentrate your forces behind the rivers and it would be near impossible for the indian forces to do a mass crossing of these rivers or should they try to do an outward approach where they try to defend the entire territory of east pakistan at all costs without surrendering any territory at all now i mean one of us remember the india like today does share a 4000 km long border with bangladesh i mean as per estimate i think it's one of the top 5 or 6 longest borders longest in the world in the world yeah 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 so it would be like a herculean task if you had to sit down and try to defend like every inch of it so uh, what the pakistani military went for that outward defense posture and the set up military garrisons near the border to thwart thwart any large scale loss of territory against an indian by attack by the indian armed forces so this was the pakistani posture of an outward defense where they just garrisoned themselves in certain strategic areas closer to the border and dhaka was left relatively uh, lightly guarded and we'll come to later in the podcast how this worked against them in the end now the indian military planners knew that the war had to be a short and swift campaign i mean uh, there as there would be an in- immense international pressure from the major powers to declare a ceasefire 
that during the 1965 war india did manage to capture a large amount of pakistani territory while losing some to pakistan by the by the time the war ended i if i recollect it correctly kishore like i think we were on the outskirts of i believe lahore by the time the war had uh, the ceasefire had been declared so um, it, it was like a, a it was a stalemate but it was still like a positive stalemate in terms of india had the upper hand now i mean some people still feel that if the war had lasted a bit longer india would have won as india had the momentum in the closing days of the war and pakistan was practically i mean running out of supply something which even pakistani authors have attested to mm-hmm. right so to ensure a different outcome versus like 6 years ago 65 versus 71 the indian military planners planned a blitzkrieg so the blitzkrieg is also like i mean referred to in like uh, it's a german term it's referred to as lightning war now it's a term which originated in world war 2 where the german forces overran most of uh, eastern europe and then later western europe in the early stages of the war like i mean around the 1939 40 41 uh, time frame i'm talking about so what blitzkrieg involves is like a overwhelming force concentration to with the intent to break through the enemy's line of defense by quick and powerful attacks using speed and surprise to encircle them including many times and i want to emphasize this point bypassing strong enemy points and enveloping and trapping them so this is like the key point that you uh, attack with speed and surprise and you bypass the strong points in many of the i think this was something that was learned in the russian war of the trench warfare of the world war 1 that just uh, fighting the enemy head on in many cases had no purpose it would just used to grind down both of the the attacker and the defender to dust and there used to be no gain or loss of territory so in the world war 2 they just went through this blitzkrieg attack where just just went with quick powerful and speedy surprising moves and this encircled the enemy and just bypass the strong point so you don't have to uh, waste your time and resources in fighting them so uh, this is like what the overall strategy was now coming to the overall war plan now uh, and unlike what some people think that the war plan in the east evolved over time it wasn't like a constant thing so initially the plan was laid out that india will capture like khulna and chittagong which are two important port cities of bangladesh so the thinking behind was is like okay we'll capture the two important port cities and choke them the imports and access to east pakistan from the outside through the ocean now the goal was to capture the maximum amount of territory before a probably and ceasefire will be called due to international pressure and we could help with the formation of a free bangladesh where refugees could be sent back i mean there was some other like dhaka could be achieved as a realistic goal and they didn't want to overcome it in that case mm-hmm. but however the uh, major general jfr jacob who was the chief of staff of eastern army command uh, objected to this plan uh, he argued like i mean that the capture of uh, dhaka versus like a capturing khulna and chittagong uh, was more crucial he believed that this was the military as we said like the command and control and the political epicenter of east pakistan and he insisted this should be the main priority of the indian campaign and later on there was some rethink and uh, a new uh, 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 the plan was revised to include dhaka as the main objective of the campaign as we got closer to the war kishor yeah okay so this was the military uh, build up uh, to the war so now let actually look at the operation per se now uh, most people are unaware that all three wings of the armed forces Uh, were involved in the 1971 war so let's begin with the the air operation now uh, on the evening of december 3 uh, pakistan air force based in west pakistan launched a preemptive air strike against india as part of operation chengiz khan the operation targeted 11 indian air force bases across western and northern india due to a whole host of factors such as india being forewarned by its sources and also not a significant amount of paf resources being committed to the attack to make an impact and a few indian countermeasures as well meant that the attack did not have much impact on the ground indira gandhi in an address to the nation later that night said that the air strikes were a declaration of war and thus 
the 1971 war had begun. Indian Air Force retaliated against the Pakistani Air Force in both the Western and Eastern sectors. By the second week of the war, India had pretty much established air superiority over East Pakistan. On the 14th of December, uh, six F-86 Sabre jets, which were actually uh, Pakistani Air Force's flagship fighters at that point in time, had taken off from Peshawar with the aim of bombing the Srinagar Air Base. Flying officer Nirmaljit Singh Sekhon, along with Flight Lieutenant Baldir Singh Ghuman, were on a two-minute standby in their GNAT, also called G-Bird planes, ready to take off within two minutes in case of an enemy attack, somewhat similar to uh, Wing Commander Abhinandan in uh, 2019. With no radar... Yeah, it is, just, mm -hmm. yeah, it is called like a optional readiness patrol or right. ORP yeah. Yeah. that uh, Abhinandan was uh, uh, doing... In, uh, I mean, incidentally, I think he was also based in... If, I, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... Uh, with no radar back then in the valley, they were given warning of impending attack by advanced scouts. Just as the Pakistani Air Force fighters started their bombing run, they took off to engage the enemy fighters. While his partner got lost in the fog surrounding Srinagar, Sikhon alone charged down on the six Pakistani fighters. In his firing at them, two of them panicked and headed back home to Peshawar damaged from the fire from Sekhon's Gnat. This left four sabers and against Sekhon's Gnat, who still continued to fight them single-handedly. Despite downing two F-86 sabers, the odds were stacked against him. Eventually, due to the damage inflicted on the Gnat by the enemy fighters, his plane went into an uncontrollable nose dive. It crashed with him on board. Even though Sekhon tried to eject from the aircraft, the ejection system had been knocked out. Later, when a wreckage of the plane was found, no less than 37 bullet marks were found on the wreckage of the plane. For these heroic actions, he was posthumously awarded the Paramvir Chakra. He remains the only air warrior to be awarded India's highest wartime gallantry award. Now, this was uh, the uh, air operations. Now, looking at the naval operations, uh, we see that on the 4th of December, three OSA-class missile boats of the Indian Navy stealthily got close to Karachi Harbor and fired their six anti-ship missiles at Karachi. They managed to sink one destroyer and minesweeper each while damaging a few other ships and destroying the vital fuel storage tanks at Karachi Harbor. Remarkably, just a few days later in Operation Python, another missile boat again got lost to Karachi and fired missiles, which sunk and damaged a few ships and destroyed the oil facility at Karachi. These attacks led to the Pakistani Navy being demoralized and meant that ships did not attempt to leave the harbor at night in fear of being attacked. This led to an almost de facto blockade of Karachi Harbor by the Indian Navy. In honor of Operation Trident, December 4th is also celebrated as Navy Day. During the 1971 war, India did suffer a setback with the sinking of the INS Kukri, which remains as the only Indian Navy vessel to be sunk by enemy action. On the 9th of December, Pakistani submarine PNS Hangor struck INS Kukri with two torpedoes. INS Kukri sank to the bottom of the Arabian Sea with 18 officers and 176 sailors, including Captain MN Muller, who chose to, who chose to go down with the ship and was awarded the Mahavir Chakra. On the Eastern Front, PNS Ghazi was on a mission to sink India's sole aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant, to hamper India's capability in the eastern sector. PNS Ghazi was reportedly sunk on December 4, 1971. While the credit for the sinking has been officially attributed 
to INS Rajput, a lot of doubts have persisted over the years as to the actual cause of the sinking of PNS Ghazi. While some have speculated that Ghazi sank as it went over one of the mines that it laid itself, while others claim that it was an internal explosion from within the submarine which destroyed PNS Ghazi. So, uh, as you see, there were quite a few aerial and naval operations that uh, were happening uh, in, in parallel to the land operations that were planned. Mohal, can you now elaborate on the land operations, both in the western and the eastern sector? Yeah, so uh, the 1971 war, there was action both on the western and the eastern sector. Mm -hmm. So I'll uh, narrate like a couple of incidents in the 71 war, like which were uh, uh, famous for the, from the western sector. So in the western sector, in the initial stages of the war on December 4th, uh, basically 3000 soldiers of Pakistan's 51th infantry regiment and 40 tanks, uh, attacked, uh, Longewala. Now the Pakistan plan was to reach Jaisalmer via Longewala, but like what thwarted by the 120 soldiers of a company battalion in the Punjab regiment, uh, the, they fought, they, they fought all through the night and valiantly held the ground and they forced an enemy into a retreat as, uh, the Indian air force. Uh, intervened at the break of dawn, killing uh, almost 200 soldiers and destroying 30 enemy tanks. I mean, India, I mean, this incident has been made famous by the JP Dutta's movie Border, uh, which was like a blockbuster hit, I believe, like two decades ago. Now, the interesting thing is that India only lost two men on that night, unlike uh, what was shown in the movie Border, where I think uh, liberally quite a huge cast of characters uh, are shown to have uh, sacrifice their lives uh, in, in the duty in, in the line of duty you know <laughs> yeah. so, so these actions uh, uh, earned their commanding officer like a brigadier and then major like Kuldeep Singh Chandapuri uh, India's uh, Chandpuri uh, India's second highest gallantry award the Mahavir Chakra um, so that's the Longevala incident and the other one was the uh, the battle of Basantar so the Shakargar like bulge is a bulge that protrudes into the Indian territory between the southern part of Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab. Now during this, uh, the Pakistanis had initially had uh, plans to invade uh, during this bulge because usually what they try to do is cut off Jammu and Kashmir from the uh, the rest of India. And I think we had there was action in this uh, around this sector in the 1965 war. So initially, like uh, Pakistan did make did make any moves, but in any eventually India moved did move into the sector. So during this uh, hard fought battle of Basantar, which was like from uh, December 6 to 16, the Indian Army won an unprecedented uh, 11 medals. There were like six Mahavir Chakras uh, uh, awarded, three Vir Chakras, and an unprecedented two Paramvir Chakras for Major Hoshiar Singh Daya and Second Lieutenant Ar Arun uh, Ketarpal uh, just for the same battle. So, uh, on like, uh, let me narrate the incident of uh, Second Lieutenant uh, Arun K Ketarpal. So, on December 16th, the Pakistani army equipped with their latest pattern tanks launched their counter offensive uh, counter attack against the 17 Pune Horse Armored Regiment during this Battle of Basantar. Now, when the squadron commander asked for reinforcements over the radio, the second lieutenant uh, Arun Ketarpal rushed with his Centurion tank into battle. He assaulted the enemy's strong points and physically overrunning them. Now, in the course of this action, the commander of one of his tanks in his troop was killed. But the Ketarpal continued to attack relentlessly uh, in, in the Pakistani uh, positions and the tanks. Now, in the ensuing uh, tank battle, like Ketarpal with his two remaining tanks fought off and destroyed like 10 Pakistani tanks, of which Ketarpal personally destroyed four tanks. Now, in the fight, uh, his tank was hit and it burst into flames and he was severely wounded. Uh, he was ordered to abandon his tank, but realizing that the enemy was still pressing their attack in this sector, he refused to do so. I mean, his fi famous final words over the radio to an officer 
who had just ordered him to abandon his burning tank were no sir and i quote no sir i will not abandon my tank my main gun is still working and i'll get those bastards end quote now so in spite of uh, grievous wounds and his tank burning he continued engaging the enemy tanks and destroyed uh, one more however his tank was hit a second time as a result of which he died but the enemy was denied the breakthrough that they were desperately looking for so for his unmatched valor on the battlefield he was awarded the paramvir chakra posthumously at age 21 he became the youngest ever soldier to be awarded the paramvir chakra a uh, record which still stands as of today um, and in his honor the parade ground at the nda the national defense academy is uh, named as uh, khetarpal ground so some amazing uh, stories of bravery from the front in the western sector in 1971 yep. in longewala and in battle of basantar so coming to the main uh, place of action the eastern sector so the eastern sector i mean as i said before there were like that the plan had called for three different army corps to attack from three different directions to envelop the pakistani army in east pakistan so the two core attack uh, was to attack from west bengal into the western part of eastern pakistan the 33 core came in and attacked from the northwest and the four core attacked it from the east into the eastern part of uh, pakistan now pakistan had believed that the area adjoining the west bengal the area of operation of the two core was the most developed in terms of infrastructure so they believe that okay the center of india's gravity of i mean the center of gravity of india's attack also referred to in military term as uh, shwerpankt would come from the west because that was the most developed area and that would be where they would attack dhaka from however interestingly dhaka as the crow flies was closest to india from the exactly opposite direction the east facing tripura however that area was massively underdeveloped so they thought like okay that would not be a feasible for india to do that now indian army under four corps moved like thousands of tons of supplies and built a massive new infrastructure of roads in tripura to help open up this front which in the end like proved decisive now led by one of uh, india's finest tactical commanders lieutenant uh, general sagat singh uh the four corps brilliantly uh, overcame all these obstacles and were the interestingly the first ones to reach the outskirts of dhaka and interestingly like sagat singh had a very uh, distinguished military career he had uh, participated in the liberation of goa in 1961 and interestingly during the nathula clashes with the chinese uh in the nathula pass uh where india gave chinese a bloody nose he was the commanding officer of the i believe the 17th mountain division if memory serves me correct so and then he participated in the 1971 so he had like a very brilliant uh, military history over his career so um uh, this was the the basic uh, premise of where the forces were positioned and uh, where the main uh, thrust of the attack came now during this uh, campaign like the air mobility uh, played a very crucial role during this campaign so what happened is like by the 8th of december the indian troops of the four corps had reached the eastern banks of the meghna river near ashuganj now pakistan fearing that the indians would cross the river fortified themselves on the western banks and blew up the bridge that uh, connected that was on the massively wide river i mean some reports say that the river was as wide as 4000 yards in certain places which is like not easy to overcome i mean this we are talking about like over like i think 4000 yards would be almost like a mile long or just under i mean actually like 3/4 of a mile or that long so it's a massive undertaking to cross such a big river so um uh, uh so the question was how to cross the river and that was a question that for uh, faced like lieutenant general sagat singh and the four corps so they didn't want to get bogged down in the advance and they just uh, decided okay we will so they came up with a brilliant operation called uh, op- operation meghna or also known as operation cactus lily so what sagat singh said like lieutenant general sagat singh he got like 14 mi4 helicopters and he flew and the, which flew over 400 non stop sorties 
over the span of 36 hours when they moved like 5,000 troops and 51 tons of supplies. So they actually like just airlifted an entire brigade uh, worth of force over the Meghna and they uh, to the from the eastern to the western bank of the uh, Meghna River. Now this brilliant maneuver uh, 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 not only like uh, caused issues where they uh, uh, now physically uh, shot the Pakistanis, but they also boxed in the Pakistani soldiers. So the Pakistani soldiers like who were boxed in were completely outfoxed by this maneuver maneuvering of the troops. And interestingly, they could also not fall back to Dhaka because now the Indian troops interestingly lay between them and Dhaka. So uh, this uh, kind of uh, boxed in and this was, I think, where I was referring to the uh, the blitzkrieg strategy of uh, encircling and enveloping that enemy and not uh, allowing him to retreat and uh, while en- uh, like just bypassing the hard points uh, in various sectors. I think this was like a general theme in many of the other sectors also. Many of the Pakistan garrisons near the border were bypassed and uh, not ha- attacked head on in most cases. And they just allowed the Indians to move with more speed and suffer less losses in the process. So uh, now the Indian soldiers, like uh, after this move, had boxed in the Pakistani soldiers and also had a relatively easier part to Dhaka without any facing any significant resistance. So as I had mentioned earlier, the outward facing approach had meant there very few troops were left for the defense of Dhaka. So once they bypassed the Meghna, they could have a, a much lesser resistance going to Dhaka. Now, by the second week of the war, the Pakistani army was on a back foot all across East Pakistan. So Pakistan army, which had pursued, as I mentioned, this de- strategy of our defending the outermost areas of East Pakistan had left Dhaka relatively unguarded as they did not want to lose any territory because they just wanted to give Indians a bloody nose at the border itself. However, they started realizing as the time went by that Indian army was advancing on Dhaka and they needed some forces to defend it. So what they planned is to plan to recall the 93rd Brigade from the northern part of East Pakistan, which was which didn't see much action compared to the other sectors. So the hope was to use this uh, brigade of troops, birth of troops for uh, uh, defense of Dhaka and then hold off for a couple of weeks by the time which international pressure would force India to declare a ceasefire. Now, Indian Army, once they got a wind of this plan, they, they came up with a plan to thwart this fallback of 93rd Brigade in a daring uh, operation named as, uh, also like named as the Tangel Airdrop. So what they did was like well behind enemy territory, they decided to draft a whole battalion of 700 plus troops from the second para battalion of the parachute regiment. And they were told to capture the Pungli bridge over the Jamuna river, which was the road, which the retreating 93rd brigade of the Pakistani army would use to get to Dhaka. So once they captured the bridge, they, they killed and reported over 340 enemy soldiers and uh, completely decimated the 93rd Brigade. And uh, apparently, I think the Brigade Commander also captured the next day after they captured it the previous evening. So this was a brilliant operation by which uh, they prevented even the few remaining remaining soldiers to fall back to Dhaka by, uh, uh, by providing a much better defense. And interestingly, like uh, the two para were one of the first forces to enter Dhaka and also attended the surrender ceremony on December 16th. Now, interesting anecdote about this story and how it relates to the overall fall was uh, the then uh, uh, mini- uh, PRO uh, Raman, Ra- uh, Raman Mohan Rao was asked by the DGMO Major Inder Singh Gill to give good publicity to the para drop. Now, they could not arrange for any pictures as the paradrop originated from a place where they had no access. I mean, this is well in the pre-internet, pre-cell phone era. Mm-hmm. So he said, okay, what do I do in that case? So he remembered that he had photos from Agra a year ago when they covered the, ex- the exercise by the para brigade. So he got these photos published saying that, okay, the Indian para brigade had been airdropped, but conveniently left out the fact that it was a file photo from the previous year. 
so what happened is this made it appear to some that instead of a b- actual battalion of 700 men an entire brigade of 5000 men was dropped behind enemy lines so i mean this was picked up and republished by foreign media like the bbc the london times and the new york times so this subterfuge subterfuge uh, uh, along with the valiant actions of the para battalion demoralized the pakistani soldiers who thought like okay you know there is like a 5000 men have been dropped in northern bangladesh and they are marching onto dhaka uh and uh, so this was uh, supposedly one of the reasons uh, where um, the pakistanis or uh, army's morale began to break down i mean in theory they could have fought much longer but this was like kind of a psychops uh, in that era kishor mm mm-hmm. mm mm-hmm. fascinating uh, stories and how uh, the indian army and the indian uh navy and the air force uh steadily but surely gained the uh, upper hand over their pakistani counterparts okay so now let's look at the closing stages of the war and how the war came to an end early on 14th december india intercepted a message by sigint uh, also called uh, signal intelligence which was also confirmed by mukti bahini sources that a large meeting of senior military and civilian officials was to be held in the governor's house in dhaka indian military leadership saw this as a good opportunity to strike at the senior leadership of the pakistani forces in east pakistan four mi 21 jets of the iaf attacked the governor governor's house with multiple rockets the roof of the room where the meeting was held caved in and the wall collapsed while no one was killed apparently this totally demoralized the pakistani leadership the civilian governor resigned immediately and fled to a neutral zone building which was deemed as safe from any attacks pakistani leadership in dhaka sent out a proposal for a ceasefire to india via the united states who for reasons unknown chose to sit on this for more than a day versus relaying <laughs> the message to india yeah i think the the hope was that they uh, wanted like uh, uh, india to i think this maybe build inter- more international what do you think like more build more pressure on india i guess yeah but i think uh, the writing was already on the wall and uh, probably uh, the us uh, saw saw that there was merit in allowing the war to continue for a day or two longer or maybe they were at hopes that the western front pakistan would claim which where they could be a barter of territory maybe in the west and the east probably in the end which mm-hmm. was like a not possible but uh, who knows i mean us did much funny stuff in that war uh, in 1971 <laughs> yeah so uh, nixon and kissinger were now worried that with east pakistan falling to india soon india might turn their attention to west pakistan a defeated west pakistan was not in their own interest due to their covert outreach to china which we already talked about mm-hmm. the us now ordered its seventh fleet which included aircraft carrier uss enterprise to enter the bay of bengal to intimidate the indians following this grave provocation from the americans india secretly activated a provision in the india soviet Uh, Indo-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, which uh, we already spoke about, where either side would come to the defense of the other if attacked. A Russian naval task force was sent to intercept the American task force under the command of Admiral Vladimir Krug- Krugliao- Krug- Krugliakov, uh, who claimed in an interview post-retirement that he was ordered to surface his submarines in full view of the american fleet i mean try to picture this you have uh, two superpowers in the bay of bengal trying to outsmart each other uh, in mm-hmm. broad daylight trying to uh, ensure that their side uh, wins over the other side I and mean, this was yeah. fascinating stuff back then yeah i think i was mentioning to somebody recently that see like people think of the war in terms of only the india pakistan bangladesh angle <laughs> but there was much more twist to it we had india we had bangladesh and pakistan obviously we had the china angle then we had the soviet angle and then we had the us angle i mean interestingly uh, somewhere i read that uh, i mean 
the good thing is that because uh, Nixon recorded all of his conversations, there was like uh, some uh, funny and bizarre conversations. So one of the ones I read about was that uh, Nixon and Kissinger were just talking about like war as child's play. I mean, they were saying, oh, if uh, India and Pakistan have gone to it, so we'll track the Chinese to intervene and attack India or move mm-hmm. some forces. So if they do, then okay, then if Russia comes to India's aid, you know, we'll go and bomb uh, Russia and, you know, <laughs> it was just like <laughs> escalating to like a, a infinity and beyond, like, you know, that what kind of uh, uh, scenarios they were thinking of then in their, in their head. Uh, like it, it just like a, it was a much larger geopolitical game than many people realize is what my the point I was trying to make. From from an astronomical point of view, I'm sorry to divert. This is uh-huh. like uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the middle of the solar system, and uh, <laughs> both balancing uh, each other, and with their own coteries of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars on one yeah, side, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto on the other side. Uh-huh, okay, uh-huh. <laughs> let's move, move on. <laughs> so uh, once uh, General Manikshah got the ceasefire message on the 15th of December, he declared a stop in fighting from that evening onwards and asked Major General Jacob to go to Dhaka to get the surrender document signed by Pakistani commander in East Pakistan, Lieutenant General Niazi. Lieutenant General Niazi first dithered on signing the surrender, arguing that they had sent over a proposal via the Americans of a ceasefire and not surrender. Major General Jacob then told him in no uncertain terms that if he did not surrender, the attacks would resume, including air attacks, and gave him 30 minutes to finalize his decisions either way. Yeah, I think the air attack was a kind of a giveaway that, okay, you know, you experienced one air attack like two days ago. And if you don't um, um, surrender, there's another air attack. I think that's why the psychological impact of the air attack on the governor's house comes into play here. You know? <laughs> For somebody who had already seen the trauma, this would have been too much. Yeah, I mean, as per uh, one of the books I read, I am not sure what's the exact reference in the book, but uh, it says that like General Niazi was almost in tears when the air attack happened. <laughs> so, and also like the, I think the other the threat laid was that, okay, if you lose in the end, like we will allow you to surrender uh, under the Geneva Convention and you will be given all the uh, respect. But like, you know, if not, like if the Mukti Bahini gets the hold of you guys, I mean, the amount of atrocities you have done, mm-hmm. I mean, you can just imagine what uh, they would have done to... Uh, the Pakistani soldiers, and I think uh, Niazi got the message uh, right. either way. Right. Yep, yep. So uh, at the end of this uh, 30 minutes, a broken and defeated Niazi agreed to surrender when Major General Jacob came back. Later that day, at the race course ground in Dhaka, in full view of, me- of the media, Lieutenant General Niazi signed the surrender document with Lieutenant General J.S. Aroda of the Eastern Army Command signing it from the Indian side, which ended the war and the hostilities. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Mohal, uh, with, uh, with the war coming to an end, do you want to talk about the legacy that the war has left behind? Yeah, so I'll quickly cover the Pakistani perspective. So, mm-hmm. from the Pakistani perspective, I mean, this was a traumatizing event where the nation was split into two. Um, I mean, they lost more than half of their land and their population. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, Pakistani, uh, I mean, understood from that day that uh, that winning it is going next to impossible to win in a uh, conventional war with uh, India. So they had to adapt its strategy against India. So this lay the path to like an eventual nuclearization of the Indian subcontinent. I believe like PM Bhutto famously remarked that we will eat grass, but we will get the atomic bomb. You know. So mm. this was seen as the uh, uh, as a necessary deterrent against uh, uh, the uh, convinced superior Indian conventional floors uh, against splitting the nation into two. Now they a few years down the road, I mean, started supporting terrorism against India to, as they say, to bleed India by a thousand cuts. Now what they have done since is when they feel threatened by India to prevent any aggressive response by India. 
they liberally used the nuclear blackmail card to blunt india's conventional superiority mm-hmm. now when yaya khan was forced to leave uh, after the debacle of the 1971 war um, zulfikar ali bhutto became the pm of pakistan now zulfikar ali bhutto is like a very interesting character in terms of pakistan so he started out as pakistan's youngest cabinet minister in 1958 and he slowly moved through the ranks becoming foreign minister in 1963 now interestingly prior to the 65 war bhutto egged on uh, pakistani dictator ayub khan to start the 65 war with an intention to capture kashmir now i mean obviously the war didn't materialize where they captured pakistan uh, kashmir at all and uh, post the conclusion of the war i mean he just laid the blame at the uh, ayub's feet and you know like resigned from the government eventually like ayub khan had to pay the price for the debacle and in came another pakistani general yaya khan now after the 71 war when yaya khan left bhutto became the president first and then after i think they had a new constitution they he became the pm now he did rule 1977 till 77 when he was deposed in uh, another one of pakistan's military coup uh, by one of his uh, hand picked generals general zia ul haq i mean who he thought who he superseded i believe like six or seven generals and uh, i mean this is sounds like uh, musharraf and uh, nawaz sharif right like nawaz right. sharif mm-hmm. superseded two generals or three generals i believe to have musharraf because he think he didn't have political ambitions and uh, <laughs> he gets deposed in a military coup so like history repeats itself you know i mean uh, not not just uh, getting replaced in a military coup but before that he conducted a kargil ahmel so uh, you cannot trust nawaz yeah, sharif true. to yeah you cannot trust yeah. nawaz sharif to uh, pick a general for himself yeah that's true but like the the funny part is that not only history repeats itself but also funny that where he would supersede other generals and pick somebody down the road and he would like just stab him in the back so mm-hmm. but anyways so under i think uh, correct me if i'm wrong even under zulfikar ali bhutto they started this path towards radicalization which was probably quickened more under zia ul haq's uh, yeah, regime yeah. yes yes so i think that led to the more radicalization of pakistan as a nation mm-hmm. and uh, i mean they they started supporting like terrorism because they felt it was in uh, the conventional superiority was just not there to uh, uh, combat india so like they went they got these two things like nuclear weapons and like terrorism to uh, fight against india you sure yep okay so that was from a pakistani perspective now let's look at it from an indian perspective uh, militarily of course so uh, until then in the previous wars like in 1947 48 and also the 1965 war this was a decisive victory against pakistan while the pain of the defeat in the 1962 war with china could never be erased this win did go a long way in soothing those wounds from just 9 years ago the military aim of capturing dhaka and helping the goal of creating an independent new nation of bangladesh was achieved india was able to withstand enormous international pressure especially from a superpower like the usa and completed a blitzkrieg campaign to liberate bangladesh in less than 2 weeks this war was meticulously planned by the indian military planners over months and there was a good level of jointness between the various arms of the indian armed forces even india's external in- intelligence agency rndaw research and analysis wing played a crucial role in the successful outcome of this war rndaw trained thousands of mukti bahini soldiers and provided crucial intelligence which was vital to the war effort one disappointment post the 1971 war was during the subsequent meeting between both nations in shimla where the shimla accord was signed Prime Minister Indira Gandhi could not extract robust assurances from the new Pakistani Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto who later reneged on the promises made during this meet by the end of the decade another major event happened in South Asia which shaped events for years to come the 1979 Afghanistan was invaded by Russia 
USA to make sure that Afghanistan would end up becoming Russia's proverbial Vietnam through a lot fully with Pakistan to help transfer aid to the local Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan who were fighting against Russia. While Pakistan worked on its covert nuclear weapons program, the USA mostly chose to look away as it needed Pakistani help to arm the rebels in Afghanistan against Russia. The sight of the 7th Fleet sailing into the Bay of Bengal had a psychological impact of straining the India-US relations for decades to come, climaxing in the 90s, uh, in the decade of the 90s. The thawing in the India-US ties post the 1998 Pokhran test started with the Jasman Singh Strobe Talbot talks uh, between the external affairs minister and the U.S. deputy secretary of state, Strobe Talbot. India-U.S. relations today are way stronger than ever before, which is diametrically opposite from the events of almost 50 years ago when the 7th fleet streamed into the Bay of Bengal. The events post-1971 war also started a phase when India started leaning towards the Soviet Union for the next two decades, forging a close relationship, including significant purchases of military equipment from the Soviets, uh, a legacy which lasts even today. Now, from a global perspective, Mohal, such a mm -hmm. brazen and quick attempt to redraw sovereign lines was considered a threat, and the United Nations passed not one, but two resolutions, Resolution 303 and 307. The first resolution was on December 6, barely three days after the war had started, asking both the sides to exercise a restraint. But with the USSR, uh, Poland, France, and the United Kingdom abstaining, there was no unanimity, and this resolution fell through. Five days after the war ended, on December 21, there was a successful resolution asking for respecting the ceasefire line in Jammu and Kashmir to be respected. Uh, this led to the subtle global recommendation that the LOC should be considered as the de facto border between India and Pakistan in Jammu and Kashmir moving forward. So Mohal, uh, as you were pointing out that once the action in the Eastern sector came to an end, uh, the United, Na United States and uh, China were worried that uh, the action might now shift to the Western sector. That is where the uh, United Nations resolution comes into picture, where uh, all the 15 members of the uh, Security Council uh, advocated that uh, the ceasefire line in the state of Jammu and Kashmir should be respected. So I think that kind of uh, drew the curtains to the war and the hostilities for the for the uh, time being, and also led to uh, the Shimla Accord being signed. Mohal. Yeah, I think uh, the the Seventh Fleet, I think, had a very uh, uh, burning. An image was burnt into the minds of several Indians for decades to come. Mm -hmm. I think today, almost fifty years after the incident, I think it's a testament to the how far the relations have come and relations are much cordial. But it would be, I mean, if you talk to even some of the veterans uh, uh, or like the elders who lived through the 70 and experience the the seventh fleet steaming into the Bay of Bengal was, uh, had left an end. I mean, uh, I, I, sorry, I can't find the word, but uh, in, I mean, sorry, I can't find the word right now, but uh, a big image in the minds for years to come. And I think that's where we saw the deal towards Russia in terms of all kinds of military hardware. And like we were practically like a close uh, ally, not a, I wouldn't say he was an ally, but a close friend of Russia till right. probably the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in the early 1990s, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so that friends, uh, friends, that brings us to the end of our podcast for today. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to this uh, dramatic events from around like 49 years ago. So now before we wind up this episode, let's switch our focus to the recommendations of the week. So Kishore, do you want to share anything which you read, which is worth recommending to our listeners? 
Uh, yes, Mohan. So uh, my recommendation for this week would be uh, the, uh, the biographical account uh, on uh, R.N. Kao, the head of the uh, research and analysis wing, uh, the spy agency. The name of the book is R.N. Kao, Gentleman Spy Master, and has been written by Nitin Gokhale. Uh, now, this book actually goes in length to uh, describe how R.N.A.W. Uh, helped turn the tide in the Bangladesh uh, Liberation mm-hmm. War by not only arming uh, the Mukti Bahini forces, but also uh, by providing uh, significant intelligence inputs to the Indian armed forces about the Pakistani uh, action uh, by their by their armed forces. I think uh, their uh, contribution was immense during the war. I think they provide a lot of actionable intelligence to the armed forces, right. which uh, helped uh, secure many victories or uh, delivered a lot of success on the battleground, which has not been uh, as much uh, contributed as to uh, as many people know. Right, right. So I uh, believe uh, the there's a movie coming out on uh, R N Kao by this by by Nitin Gokhale. If I'm if I'm correct, I think they bought the rights before the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. So the hope is that eventually a movie will be made, which will give true justice to this uh, towering legend of India. Mm-hmm. who also had a uh, i think 1971 as many say was one of their uh, finest moments for the raw i guess along with the 1975 uh, accession of sikkim to the union of india you know correct 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 yep uh, i mean uh, w- one can only hope that uh, such a movie does justice to these uh, uh, towering uh, gentlemen and does not uh, take does not end yeah. up taking so, uh, artistic liberties to yeah, I mean, interestingly, since you talk about movies, I mean, I know we had those uh, run-of-the-mill movies like, uh, I believe, like Razi and what was there, another one with John Abraham, I forget, like Raw, which was mm-hmm. we did in the 71 war. But the ones in the pipeline are also interesting. So there is a Vicky Kaushal movie uh, On, uh, with Sam, Sam Manekshaw. Correct, correct, correct. And... Uh, the a movie on Arun uh, Ketarpal, like India's youngest Paramvir Chakra. Mm-hmm. Uh, surprisingly, they picked like Varun Dhawan to play it. So I'm not sure if we'll what? be able to do justice to, <laughs> <laughs> to do justice like a Varun Dhawan, like a mid 30s oh guy God. playing as a 21 year old uh, second lieutenant uh, tank commander. So it'll be interesting to see like how much justice like with this RN Kao movie, the movie on Arun Ketarpal and Sam Manek show. So Sam Manek I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of uh, history to be brought out from the '71 war in bunch of upcoming movies. Is what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, Mohal, you want to uh, give your recommendation for the week, not the movies, yeah, so, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean it won't. <laughs> it won't be a movie. <laughs> so my recommendation for the week is uh, this fantastic book I read. Uh, it's called '71 Dash to Dhaka. Mm-hmm. Written by uh, Major General G.D. Bakshi. Uh, Bakshi. I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you, you've seen him on TV coming in very various debates on military and defense affairs. So, uh, this covers the entire gamut of events uh, right from 1970 to the end of the war, and events uh, goes into detail in both the military and the uh, political aspects of the war, you know. Okay, okay. So with that, uh, friends, we come to the end of this week's episode uh, where we looked at the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War and even from 49 years ago, which had profound effect on the subcontinent ever since. Uh, to continue hearing about such interesting topics, uh, do subscribe to our channel, India Rising. And wherever you are listening to us, if you're listening to us on YouTube, please press the bell icon to get notifications about new episodes. If you haven't left us a review, we urge you to do so as it helps other listeners like you in finding us. We would also like to hear from you if you have any suggestions on any topics that you would like us to cover. Do remember that these topics should be directly related to Indian foreign policy. Until the next time, this is Mohal and Kishore signing off.